Good morning, church. I'm Wes McAdams, the preaching minister for the Church of Christ on McDermott Road in Plano, Texas, and it is so good to be with you this morning. I appreciate Paul so very much and for his invitation to be part of your worship service this morning. I'm going to read a scripture and then have a prayer with you. The scripture this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for what you have done for us in Jesus. We thank you, Father, for his becoming man and humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. We thank you, Father, for making peace through the blood of his cross. Father, we pray that you help us to have the mind of Jesus. Help us, Father, to consider others more significant than ourselves. Help us, Father, to look out for the interests not only of ourselves, but also of others. Help us to consider others to be more significant than ourselves. Help us, Father, to be unified. Help us, Father, to love one another as Jesus has loved us. Father, as we worship you today, as we worship you every day, help us to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Help us to pray for one another and love one another and help one another and encourage one another as this church and temple is doing. And Father, I pray your blessings on them and on all of your people throughout the world. May we be at peace May we have and be filled with love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we walk by the Spirit so that this will be our fruit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church.
were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even averted their gaze from the sight. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word, but chose to be silent, though you did no wrong, nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come, yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name, He has enthroned you on high, Jesus the name
we come to the point in our worship where we participate in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a critical part of what we do as the Lord's people each Sunday. We reflect upon the great sacrifice Jesus made for us, but there's not only just the mental reflection upon Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, but there's also the physical eating and the physical drinking as a tangible way to remember Jesus Christ. I would like to read from Luke chapter 22, the account of the first Lord's Supper, beginning in verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray as we give thanks for the bread. Holy God, our Father, we thank you for this bread that we are about to partake, an emblem representing the body of Jesus Christ his body that was beaten, bruised, and ultimately nailed to the cross of Calvary. An act of selflessness on our behalf so that we may be forgiven of the sins that we have committed. Father, we pray that we would partake of this in a manner that pleases you. We pray, God, that in all things that it's your will being done and not our own. We thank you so much, God, for that sacrifice, the love that was poured out on that day. We thank you for the willingness of Jesus to go through with that sacrifice, and it's through his name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. I want to continue reading in the same passage from Luke chapter 22, this time verse 20. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us pray as we give thanks for the cup. Holy God, our Father, we thank you for this cup this fruit of the vine, a representation of the blood of Jesus Christ, blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sin and a sacrifice that we are so unworthy of. But by your grace, by your love, by your mercy, it was carried out and fulfilled to perfection. Father, we thank you for the willingness that Jesus displayed to go through with such a sacrifice. We thank you for what it means to us, and we pray, God, that we would partake of this in a manner that, that is pleasing to you. We thank you for all things, and it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Amen.
we are now at the portion of our service where we give back to the Lord as we have been prospered. And it's always a blessing to be able to do so. Uh, there's so much to be thankful for. I know that this has been a crazy year, but at the end of it all, we still have uh, all of the many blessings that we get from God. And, and our way of giving back to him uh, is through our contribution, through the ways that he has uh, provided for us, because he always provides for us in, in all things. Uh, even in uh, some of our darkest times, he uh, blesses us and, and gives us a way uh, to see through to the next. And so at this point, uh, let, us, let us bow and give thanks uh, for the blessings that God has given to us and uh, pray for the use of the money that is being offered. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we are so thankful for your wonderful blessings. You do so much for us, and we're grateful. We ask your blessing upon the offering that you will uh, bless those that give, that you will bless the uh, using of the funds, that it will, it will be always for your glory. We are so thankful for the generous hearts of our members, and we're thankful for their sacrifice and for their love. And Lord, we know giving is one way that we can express love to you. But Lord, we want to give our whole lives. We want to give our devotion. We want to give our best efforts in service to your kingdom because we love you so much. Lord, we pray your blessing upon this collection. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hey.
Today I want us to look back and look ahead. Let's look back to God's special people Israel. Let's imagine their expectations for a coming Messiah. And then let's look ahead to the Christians' expectations of a coming again Lord. But first, let's pray together, asking for the blessings of God. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can worship. We are thankful to be your people, that we have received the wonderful blessings of salvation through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We give thanks. We petition, Lord, for your continued blessings upon us. We are confident that your grace for us will continue um, undiminished. Lord, we are thankful for the ways that you bless us physically with incomes and uh, the things of life. Lord, we're grateful for our family. Lord, we're grateful for the health that we have. And yet, Lord, we know that there are some who are suffering from poor health, who are suffering from poor living conditions, and are living in fractured families. And so, Lord, we pray that you will continue to be engaged in the affairs of the world, that you will walk with us closely as your children, that you will continue to bless us with grace and favor. And Lord, we petition that you will minister to those that are in need. Give them peace and comfort in accord with your will. Bless our study time. Help us, Lord, to think in a meaningful way about your word and your truth. Help us to reflect very carefully upon your majesty and the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to be compassionate to each other. Help us to be sacrificial in our love for one another. And Lord, we commit these moments to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most exciting things a family will ever experience is the pregnancy visit where uh, they do the ultrasound to check on how the baby is doing in the womb. It's a, a very emotional experience to see the little baby and the unmistakable heartbeat. We've experienced that with our children and it's always a very exciting thing, a very joyful thing. It, it's a strange mix, actually, of concern. You want the little baby to do well and to be healthy, and also excitement about what we anticipate when the baby is born. Now, that little bit of photo paper is a neat, uh, the sonogram, the ultrasound image. But think for a moment, how does it compare to the actual holding the baby, kissing their soft cheek? Let's telescope forward. The baby's arrival, you get to hold the baby. You get to hear the baby, feel the baby's skin and hair, and you get to interact with the baby. This is the real thing. Compared to a, a piece of paper which foreshadows an arrival with the actual event, uh, the two are markedly different, aren't they? The piece of paper with the sonogram gives you excitement about things to come. You anticipate the real thing. So again, I'm wanting to illustrate, imagine there's a big difference, right, between the, the piece of paper with the image, as exciting as that is, but compared to the future reality of holding the baby, cradling the baby, those things are very different. You know, I think we live in a state of great expectation. Just as a fish can't avoid water, we similarly swim in a world saturated with future-mindedness. We're always leaning forward just a bit, trying to glimpse tomorrow. 
And for ancient Israel, they were in great expectation of the anointed one who would arrive and lead with dramatic effect. We think of uh, the great prophetic texts in Isaiah and Psalms. Uh, For example, Isaiah foretold the coming of a child, a son who would be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and whose kingdom will never end. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Again, uh, just another example in Isaiah. The, The prophet prophesied the coming of a branch of David on whom the Spirit of God would rest, who will rule the earth with justice and equity. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Messianic expectation is a way of describing the expectation that an anointed person will come to redeem Israel. In fact, the Old Testament is pregnant with anticipation for a coming Messiah. And Christians believe that Messiah did indeed come in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. I don't think Israel could have possibly imagined the nature of Christ's incarnation and then His earthly ministry. They certainly could not have anticipated a a two-tiered advent, Christ's incarnation and then His coming again in a future final judgment, Uh, the two separated by thousands of years. Well, we of course don't know how much time will separate the two advents. Well, let's think about that word in particular, the word advent. It means coming. It is from the Latin arrival. And the Bible vividly describes the first coming of the Son of God. Let me read from Luke chapter 2. Let me read verses 7 through 11. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The second advent of the Son of God is also vividly described in Scripture. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me move over and read for you verses 7 through 10 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 through 10. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His might. And when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. All right. I'm encouraging us to think about these two comings, arrivals, advents of Christ. The first in His incarnation when He was born as a human man, and the second, which is yet future for us, His imminent coming again in judgment. Now, the two advents or comings of Christ are similar in some respects and yet different. When the Son of God came to earth, born as a human man, there was celebration and rejoicing. 
And even today, over 2,000 years later, we hail the birth of Jesus as an event to be extolled. And the purpose of His coming was to complete the work of God in saving humanity. And He accomplished this on the cross with His atoning death for humanity's sin and through His victory over the grave in His glorious resurrection. And though the circumstances of His arrival were very humble, the impact of the Incarnation changed the world forever. Likewise, His second coming will be a time when believers celebrate the inauguration of the celestial abode. This world will end and new life in heaven will begin. Now both the incarnation and the second coming enact dramatic change. These are moments in time when God employs master strokes of divine action resulting in a dramatic change for humanity. Just as the the birth of a child dramatically changes a home, so also these workings of God in the world affect us to the very core. Now certainly God works continuously in the world, yet in these two Advent moments, He moves with fantastic world-altering power. Now similar in some respects, these two Advent events are distinct. As we honor the first, we cannot forget the promise of a second. When the Son of God came the first time, It was in a humble manger as a helpless baby sleeping in an animal feed trough. When He came the first time, He came as our redeeming Savior. When He comes again, it will be with power and a legion of mighty angels heralding His arrival. When He comes again, He will be our judging Lord. The Incarnation is a meager scene of humble beginnings. Jesus was born a baby in Bethlehem. The second coming is a cataclysmic inbreaking, ushering in a dramatic end. Jesus will descend as sovereign Lord. And for you and me, the time between Jesus' two advents is incredibly significant. We must use the time we've been allotted to live out the faith implications of the Incarnation and to look with a readied gaze toward the inevitable return of Jesus Christ. After all, Christianity declares a manger and a cross. We affirm Jesus' birth and an imminent return. As you enjoy the Christmas season. Remember Jesus not just as an infant in a manger long ago, but also as a coming King of glory. Heaven for us is now an as yet unseen expectation. But when the Lord Jesus returns, it will be wonderful. If we keep in mind every day that there is an imminent return of Christ, I think as Christians this is something we should emphasize perhaps more than we do that we are are living in anticipation. We are looking for the coming again of Jesus Christ. When I was a little kid, I grew up in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, and on Thursday nights, Dad would bring home pizza from work for us to eat for dinner. And that was always an exciting thing for us, especially, well, for me as a little kid. And we lived close to the highway, and I knew, I learned the highest point in the front lawn. I would run out on Thursday when it was about the time that Dad would be getting home. I would run out, and I knew the spot, the the highest spot in the front lawn. And I could stand there, and I could get on my tiptoes and stretch my neck, and I could look up the highway, and I would be able to recognize his car when it came over the hill headed for home. And I would look and I would be so excited. And when I spotted his car, I would run in and report, P-1000! 
pizza is here. And it was an exciting thing. I, I can remember vividly the, the excitement of a child. You know, the New Testament has this kind of tone about it. It has this kind of vibe, this kind of feeling. Anticipation, excited anticipation for what's coming. Jesus Christ, we live by faith in the here and the now, but we are looking and longing for the yet to be. We live in this tension. It's described as the already and the not yet. <laughs> we already enjoy benefits of being the children of God. We enjoy the benefits of forgiveness and salvation as Christians because of what Jesus has done for us. We have already received wonderful blessing and gifts. But there is also a, a not yet. We're not yet in heaven. We're still living in the midst of a broken world, but we're anticipating a glorious future ahead. And we believe confidently, this is a hallmark of Christianity. We believe, we affirm without reservation, with confession and conviction and confidence and commitment that there is an imminent return of Christ. When we will be sure to see Him and be with Him. And in light of what we anticipate, then, then we live our lives with clarity of priority, with diligence and obedience, and with patient endurance. If you are not a Christian, please come to faith in Jesus now so that when He comes to you, it will be a joyful embrace and not a sad separation. If you wish to contact us, to reach out to us, we would love to try to minister to you, to help you become a Christian or to help you renew your faith, your walk with the Lord. Here on the screen, I've put our contact information. You can call us at the church office no one answers, just leave a message. You can email us on our Gmail email account. You can check out our website if you want to learn more about the Northside Church of Christ. And you can see current happenings that we're doing on our Facebook page. And also on Facebook, you can click on Messenger, and that's another way to send us a message to contact us. We want to minister to you. Uh, we're eager to do that. Uh, we believe spiritual matters matter the most, and if we can help you in your faith journey, we want to do that, certainly. The biblical message is clear. Jesus has come as Savior. He did the work assigned Him to, to do, that He was assigned to do, and, and has returned to heaven. And He will come again. There is a day coming. We can't predict when it will be, but there's a day coming when the Lord Jesus will return and He will call His people home. Thank you for listening. God bless. thank you for the sending of your son Jesus Christ and for the record that we have of him coming and leaving heaven and humbling himself under the circumstances of which he did and, and living the, the perfect life that he lived and giving himself as the sacrifice that we so desperately needed 
Uh, Father, we uh, thank you for the promise of his return, and we, we long for that. We uh, pray, God, that you would be with us as we close this, this worship. Uh, we pray that everything that we have said and done would be pleasing in your sight. We pray that you would be with us as we go throughout this week and throughout the rest of our lives, God, until uh, Jesus comes again. We pray that in all things that your will be done. It is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again real soon.